It can be a teacher. The goal is to solve for x, which means to find the value of x that makes the equation true. Would you like me to walk you through how to solve it? An assistant. You have a meeting with your manager at 1 p.m. Your report is due by end of day, and you've got that coffee catch up with your mum in half an hour. It can even be your personal sous chef. Heat olive oil in a large pot over medium heat. Add onion, carrot, and celery, and cook until softened, about five minutes. So can it fix our health system? The discovery of new medicines could be up to 10 times quicker thanks to, you guessed it, AI. Some companies are training artificial intelligence models to develop new drugs and healthcare investors, well, they're definitely taking note. Kia ora, I'm Davina Zimmer, and if I told you that a mobile phone app could detect brain injuries, you might think I've spent a bit too long spiralling down the social media rabbit hole. But stick with me, because today on The Detail, we're talking to an expert who's working on a project that's making this quite bizarre concept a reality. AUT Sam Madanyan is part of a team of American and Kiwi experts from various research fields who are creating a mobile phone app which, once it's fully developed, could even detect mental health conditions and serious brain disorders like dementia in its earliest stage. This uh, mobile application is designed to record speech Uh, plus some other context and background or demographic information, it can come up with, I would say, suggestion. It'll be some time before the technology can actually be used, but it's not the first taste of artificial intelligence the health sector has experienced. And advancements in MRI technology, thanks to artificial intelligence, an MRI outpatient centre in Springfield now has the ability to cut patient scan time. Artificial intelligence probably evokes images of ChatGPT and robots, but the term was actually first recorded in the mid-1950s. Reza Shayamiri, a senior lecturer in software engineering at the University of Auckland, describes AI as an umbrella term for several technologies. The first area that AI has been very instrumental is with reading and analyzing uh, medical imaging, CT scans, MRI, etc. As humans, we cannot analyze an image pixel by by pixel. We just don't have that ability. So we need to have extra tools to go that level of details and that level of zoom. AI can do that and, and it can do that without getting tired continuously. It can keep looking at pixels one by one and it could pick up a lot of extra information that a naked eye could miss and provide a more insight to the healthcare professional. Another use of AI is to basically predict a uh, Uh, surgical outcomes based on patient's history, genome sequencing, and the current condition, for example, chance of survival, uh, effectiveness of the surgery, etc. In surgical rooms, AI-powered robotic arms are being used to uh, make the surgery a lot more precise and less invasive. So instead of cutting the patient wide open, it could just provide a very slim cuts and then they could help the surgeon to navigate and perform the surgery. We could uh, significantly reduce recovery times, uh, complications out of uh, the surgery, and overall improving uh, patient outcomes. In 2011, Reza started a project called Atypical Speech Recognition, developing an AI that understands children living with speech impairments to help them communicate. I was focused on a specific type of disability called dysarthria, which is caused by uh, head trauma, stroke, Parkinson's disease, etc. That basically impacts how we produce uh, speech, make make our speech uh, highly unintelligible, which makes it very difficult for these individuals to communicate and talk to talk with these hours. So for the past 13 years, I have building uh, different AI technologies to enable computers to understand these individuals and talk on their behalf. He's also working on an app that can identify autistic traits in children as early as 18 months. Around 27% of autistic children 
remain undetected by the age of six to seven. And that's a critical age because uh, after basically this age, children lose their chance to benefit best from the support plan that are available. So it's critical that we identify children as early as possible so they could benefit most from these plans that are available and the support that, that are available for them. What we are doing is we are basically training an, an AI system that could basically pick up autistic indicators uh, in a very easy and accessible way to help with screening and early identification of, of autistic children. So even if parents and caregivers are not informed about what indicators they should look in for their children, they could still utilize this AI and basically they can use it to do a pre-screening and seek support if required. How does that work? Is it a phone app? Is it a separate device? It's just a mobile application currently available for everyone using an Android device, and it's free to use. It's called Autism AI. You just install it on your phone. It asks you a few questions, and it gives you an indication whether you have similarities uh, to other individuals in the system who are uh, identify themselves as uh, autistic. Uh, we are uh, actively improving its AI to basically make it more comprehensive and make it more precise. We're all told... Like it's the doctor's worst nightmare when a patient comes in and says, I Googled my symptoms and it told me ABC. How is this app different? Well, uh, what it basically does, it compares your child's in terms of behavioural indicators with other people who have been diagnosed. So this tool does not diagnose, it's just a screening tool. Uh, so doctors need to do diagnosis. Uh, people should actually rely on doctors. Uh, although I am working with uh, medical experts, to make this tool a more of a diagnostic tool, but it has to be used in the hands of experts as an extra tool in their disposal. On the other end of the age spectrum, AI technology is being developed to detect dementia in its earliest stages. While there isn't a cure for this disease yet, Reza says the earlier someone is diagnosed, the better, because it gives them more opportunity to slow the progression of the disease and get the right support. Uh, it sits on your phone and uh, you authorize it to listen to your conversations or your parents' conversation or your elders' conversations. And then while it, it basically works in the background, it checks for memory flaws and signs of dementia. And if uh, it reaches to a level to be uh, basically suspicious, it could pop in some uh, just quick tests and quizzes and increase awareness uh, that whether somebody is developing to get to dementia. So that's another project in our, in our pipeline as well. So it's similar to the autistic screening tool in that it's not a diagnostic tool, but it just helps raise some red flags. Yes, okay. that's, that's correct. Obviously, I mean, we see it in the headlines every day. Our health system is incredibly close to the edge. Some may even argue slowly teetering over it. Does um, incorporating more AI technologies have the potential to save our health system? Absolutely. That's exactly what I'm actually focusing on. AI could provide a lot of automation, uh, could make it a lot easier for doctors to provide care, to make diagnosis. So uh, that's the promise that is my goal, to make healthcare more accessible, faster, and more effective, not replacing doctors and nurses, just give them more tools to be more productive, make their life easier. There will be people out there who are very hesitant about this. I mean, it can feel like sometimes AI is taking over our lives. What would you say to people who are apprehensive about using AI in healthcare to put them at ease? Well, I would say you should trust your doctors, okay? If your doctor has trust in using a tool, that means that tools has been vigorously evaluated and, and been regulated, and your, your medical doctor, who you're trusting your health, is basically approving to use that. He or she or they rely on that tool. So what I recommend is don't trust the technology. Trust your healthcare provider. They are the ones who are trained and who are responsible to take care of our health when we are sick, so we should trust them.
we need to put it, uh, some context into uh, all this progress. If your listeners assume that in, in the near future, they walk into their clinics and instead of working with nurses and doctors, they will work with AI robots, that's not happening, all right? The technology is not even remotely there to replace nurses and doctors. And I advocate that it shouldn't actually never happen. What we need to emphasize is AI is just another tool. It's a tool that doctors and, uh, and nurses could utilize along with the, all the other tools that they have to provide better care. The AI itself is not an independent entity. It's a software, but at the end of the day, it's the medical doctor, it's the nurses who will take action, who will take decision, who will provide patient care. They just use these tools to come to, to, to make it better, faster, more accurate, and more precise, and hopefully a lot more uh, cheaper and accessible. Uh, the idea that robots will change uh, doctors and nurses, that's not something that I have seen any evidence of, and that's not definitely not something that I actually pursue. Even the uh, robotics arm that I mentioned, it's controlled by a trained surgeon to use the robot. So it's not an independent entity. It operates under the supervision of the surgeons. We need to move away from uh, that science fiction concept of AI, if we ever get to that level, to have super uh, human intelligence. We first need to get to human level of intelligence. We're not even there yet. AI is just another tool, it's a type of software. Yes, a software could be dangerous, could do bad, could do harm, and then it could do good as well. It's generally the people who are using the technology is behind whether the technology is being used for good or bad. And it seems more and more of these good parts are being developed. Sam Madanyan is a senior lecturer in computer science and software engineering at AUT. It was a phone call home while she was living abroad and experiencing the roller coaster of emotions that many who've lived overseas will be familiar with that sparked her idea. I said, hi, mom. And she said, OK, what's wrong? And I said, what? It, it was just two words, hi, mom. And then how my mom realised that I'm not in my best mood. Some call it mother's intuition, but Sam wondered if there was more to it. I started thinking about, OK, the way that we, we talk, the way that we communicate, it has a more sort of a, another dimension on top of the context. This is how I started looking at uh, the area of people's speech. Fast forward to present day, Sam is six years into a project where she's working together with experts from a variety of research fields, both here and in the US, to create an app that can detect abnormalities in the brain by analysing speech. Here's how it works. Based on psychology, uh, we have seven emotions or six emotions plus neutral. Uh, Sad, happy, pleasant, angry and maybe upset. Uh, what I did is I look at the signal of the speech. For example, if you are happy, the signal of the speech, the same context, is different from when you are sad or when you are angry. Eventually, the goal is that this tool can screen for mental health conditions and detect more serious brain disorders like dementia and Parkinson's in its earlier stages. Right now, it's being developed to detect the severity of a brain injury. The tool could be especially helpful for newly graduated doctors and nurses who don't have the years of experience to identify what can be very subtle red flags. This uh, mobile application is designed to record speech uh, plus some other context and background or demographic information. For now, it's cloud-based because uh, I haven't still figured it out how to do everything on a like a mobile device or a cell phone. So it would, let's just say, in a scenario, a doctor is in a consultation with a patient. Yes. They whip out this app on their phone mm-hmm. and they press record. They ask the patient, I guess, some standard questions. Uh the, the, the good thing is it's not a standard question. Uh, one of the main things in consultation with patient is 
they talk with each other. And what I want to do is just run the app and the app automatically uh, capture. Okay. So then they, they turn on the app and they just continue having a normal yeah. conversation. Yeah. And then once it's done its mm-hmm. whole process, like what what does it come up with? Is it numbers? Like is there like a scale where it's like says this person is happy, this person is Yes. Extremely suicidal. This is what we want to achieve. Uh, with a team in US, we have a bio engineer, we have a computer scientist, and we have uh, a speech pathologist. And uh, she's the one who give us the test that we give to the patient. In uh, mental health, we have some uh, research limitation, uh, especially when uh, we uh, work with vulnerable population. That's why uh, we try to identify mild traumatic brain injury because it has more standard speech tests. This is number one. And number two is majority of these cases, they cannot be recognized unless uh, doctors advise for CT scans or MRI. And the problem with CTs and MRI is they're expensive and there is a huge waiting list. Mm. It's very common for someone if you ask mm-hmm. them, how are you going? And they're like, oh, I'm fine. Yeah. Is it possible that this this tool, if someone masks their emotions, and yes. we know we've seen this in people who are autistic, specifically yes. female mm-hmm. who are autistic, are very good at masking. Is that something the technology can still read through? Yes, it's possible. And it would be great that we give uh, something like a tool uh, for teachers in the classroom to identify, okay, what is the emotion of this kid? Not all the teachers uh, know how to handle, uh, for example, uh, autism uh, or kids with special needs. Or the other common thing is as a lecturer, uh, going to the class, I talk for, for example, two hours. It gives me something like a signal that, okay, students are getting bored. So I can't change the class activities. Okay, but how do we know that this AI won't run rampant and diagnose people with problems they don't have? Well, we are nowhere near that, at this stage anyway, and there are safeguards in place. We build up a team, a multidisciplinary team, uh, because I really believe on the strong point of having multidisciplinary people to inform all the decisions when we develop the AI model in the earlier stages. It's not done yet, Mm. but uh, these are things that so far uh, we try to put them into consideration. So it's still a while off. We're we're not going to be going to our doctor next week and they're going to whip out an AI tool and say, hey, let me test your speech. No, no, no. no. It's, it's, uh, I would say uh, it, it would be a, a long journey and we don't want to rush it into the market or into the healthcare setting. We need to make sure about all the downsides of the technology, the model, especially what might go wrong, the model itself and all the outcome. Uh, these are the things that we try to capture along the way when we uh, develop the model and doing the research. Sam says the current model they're testing is 90% accurate with reading human emotions. When it comes to detecting mild traumatic brain injuries, there's still some work to be done, with that success rate sitting just below 70%. Once improvements have been made, the next step is engaging with health experts about how the app can be used in medical settings. Because I'm a computer scientist. Yes, my passion is digital health, but I'm not a healthcare professional. I definitely need uh, people with the healthcare background to comment on. Can it falsely detect? Yes. 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 And so what what are you doing to try and stop that? Uh, This is one of the things that I've said. We try to find those uh, odd cases. Mm. Why it detected wrong? Uh, Is it uh, something in the speech? Maybe it's accent. Uh, The other thing uh, that we came across is age. Your younger version 
and your older version sound or speech is different from acoustic features. So age, uh, gender, whether you're uh, English as a first language or it's as a second language, the person itself. Because the way that I communicate or talk, sometimes it's quite fast. Or some people, they are quite slow in terms of talking. And it's nothing wrong with them. It's just the way they talk. So these are cases that uh, we, we would like to see and discover. We see AI failing. I yes. mean, we did a podcast earlier this year with some quite bizarre chat GPT things like suggestions of gasoline spaghetti and that cats mm-hmm. have been on the moon. And health is a very, it's a very vulnerable area. How yes. can we trust that it won't fail? That's the common question that I get the yeah. uh, majority of the time. I look at AI as enabler. I won't say that this specific technology is a silver bullet. What I normally tell my student is uh, technology is a gray area. It's not pure black or white. It comes with some limitation. And this is the case with AI. One of the things with AI is with the U.S. team, when we develop the proof of concept, is based on the American accent because the collected data from uh, 700 college students in the U.S. is based on American accent. So what I try to do is to collect some uh, New Zealand uh, data as well uh, with a representation from different ethnicities. Uh, The other barrier or limitation of the current system is about the accent. For example, if English is your first language, uh, it's different from people like me. I I have another background and I have another culture and so on. These are things that we need to put into consideration. We cannot push technologies into the healthcare until we completely aware of all the downsides of the technology or its limitations. But uh, on the other hand, I won't say that this technology make any diagnosis, any decision. I would say that it helps. It, it, it helps to measure something that so far uh, no physician could measure it. Again, all the diagnosis, everything is on doctors. This is what I really try to advocate in terms of the usage of AI in healthcare, especially in healthcare, because it's it's very vulnerable. It's a matter of live and death. Uh, that's why I never label any of these, even proof of concept, as diagnostic tools. I always call them decision support tool. And uh, there, there would be no sort of intention of removing people or replacing them with this system. That's all for now. The Detail is a newsroom production supported by RNZ and New Zealand On Air. This episode was engineered by Phil Benj and produced by Alexia Russell. Thanks to Sam Madanyan and Reza Shahamedi. I'm Davina Zimmer. Ka kite anō.